Good evening, Remote Sensing 255. So, <clears throat> I'm assuming you've already did part A, which is uh, walked you through some of the terminology and some of the basics and showed you some of the things that you can do in Socket and you played around a bit. Now we're going to specifically work through parts of the Remote Sensing um, PDF that they have, and I have, I'm going to add that in as well, and so you can, if you want to go in and look at some more stuff, you can, but we're just going to do uh, a few things here, and so this uh, little video is going to be your lab, and some bonus lecture, because, I mean, come on, who doesn't want a bonus lecture, right? Yeah, cool. So a short outline, <clears throat> we're going to... Um, Review a couple remote sensing topics: topics, electromagnetic spectrum, panchromatic, multispec, hyperspec, pan sharpened, image processing, uh, specifically pre-processing. We'll talk a little bit about classification, and then we'll work through sort of some demos. And then, at the end of the demos, you're going to do some stuff on your own. And once you've completed that, you'll take a screen grab of what I ask and submit that for your lab score for this week. And once you've done that, you are done for the week in this class. So when we talk about the electromagnetic spectrum, <clears throat> it's a range of electromagnetic radiation frequencies. So that spectrum is just, you know, all the different frequencies within that range uh, that we're looking at. The sun's radiant radiation reflects off of objects between certain ranges, uh, and we consider those visible light, uh, 380 to 760, and it is something we can see with our naked eye. Objects and materials have different characteristics at different parts of the electromagnetic spectrum. Certain things absorb or reflect differently at different spectra. The goal of spectral sensors is to allow us, the viewers, to identify materials based on this characteristics of the response in terms of what gets reflected or what gets absorbed relative to a particular or group of electromagnetic spectrum, or a group of frequencies along the electromagnetic spectrum. And the spectrometers that we use in a lot of these multi-spectre, multi-spec and, hi and hyperspec sensors they detect a lot of radiation that's outside of the visible range. And so it actually makes it useful because we can get more information than what we can actually see. And that can be quite useful. And here is the electromagnetic spectrum if you've forgotten what it looks like. What is multi-spec? Well, when we talk about multi-spectrum, multi-spectral imageries or MSIs, uh, that's something that typically contains between 3 to 16 bands. Limited number. Uh, still a lot of utility. Most satellite multispectral imagery contains at least four bands, uh, and that approximates red, green, blue, green, red, and near infrared. And then each pixel is a combination of these recorded wavelengths. The lower spatial, they have lower spatial resolution, but multiple bands are viewed together in different color combinations, and typically uh, four times lower than panchromatic. And so what is panchromatic? Panchromatic is a single band image that displays as shades of gray. Panchromatic band is a significantly wider bandwidth than an individual spectrum. And so it covers more of the electromagnetic spectrum. Because of this, you get a higher resolution. And then you have hyperspectral imageries. Um, there is no real exact standard on this. Basically, if it's got more than multi-spec, we usually consider it <clears throat> hyperspectral. There can be hundreds of bands in between just the UV and the long wave infrared. Um, it has a very reduced spatial resolution, resolution, and unlike multi-spec, it, it collects continuously with no gaps in the collection. Uh, but a lot of these bands, um, they pick up a tremendous amount of noise, 
uh, because of atmospheric interference and other things to the point that some of them really don't have any actual image information at all. Now you'll hear people talk occasionally about something called pan sharpening. Pan sharpening combines the best qualities of pan chromatic and multispectral imaging. It merges the high resolution of the pan chromatic with the colors from the multispec. Now if you're going to do spectral analysis you should do this before you do pan sharpening. And so socket contains a bunch of algorithms to do this. Brovi, uh, there's a in intensity U saturation, intensity U saturation near infrared, and then there's Ehlers fusion. These are just different means of doing uh, different algorithms for pan sharpening. Pan chromatic and multispec should have similar geometries, including the terrain. Can improve your results if the images don't line up. Uh, you can do a registration um, before you do the pan sharpening. Now, Image pre-processing. This is something that you will either do much or none of, typically. Um, a lot of times what we look for is finished product <sighs> from USGS or places like that and other repositories. They're sort of like tier one products that have already been um, pre-processed to, to get rid of a lot of the issues. But it's not impossible for you to learn how to do this on your own. When we talk about image processing, we're really talking about algorithms that are used to perform intermediate steps, often necessary to clean up and calibrate spectral data before you do things like classifications. Uh, use the algorithms that they offer in here as a, uh, to create an output image and use the resulting image as the input for other algorithms is basically how this works. Um, some of the basic pre-processing algorithms they have is basic destripping. Now what happens is because of the way these sensors work, you get line features sometimes that show up because of the nature of the device. Basic destripping reduces the horizontal and vertical stripping that's caused by noise. Uh, you can also calibrate, calibrate for reflectance. This transforms your radiance and reflectance values and, um, that you often need if you're doing like material identification. It also allows you to use imagery from different sensors. There's the IARR, which is a noise removal one. Uh, it's really useful in barren areas of imagery, as well as dark subtraction. It's a simple noise reduction. It finds the minimum value for each band and subtracts it out to create a sharper image. So instead of um, if you don't have, for example, 256 different values in that particular frequency, it stretches from the minimum value you have up to the max so that um, you see more detail. Then there's atmospheric correction, which removes color shifts in the image caused by the atmosphere. We talk about classification. Uh, we're talking about two kinds, unsupervised and supervised. Unsupervised classification is an algorithm used to analyze imagery by automatically grouping similar pixels. Ugh. Sorry for the yawning. Unsupervised means that the algorithm runs without the user defining any signatures of interest. The results show colors representing classes such as water, vegetation, soil, etc. Number of classes is set in uh, the parameters when you do this. The more classes, the longer it takes to compute. Now, how does it do this? There's a bunch of different ones. Under unsupervised uh, classification algorithms, here's just a few that are out there. K-mean clustering, ISO data, band ratio, NDVI, NDWI, tasseled cap, and geo palette. Um, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, we'll utilize one or two of these today. Um, if you like, by all means, go back and try some of the others. Supervised classification algorithms are used to match in scene pixels to existing spectral signatures, uh, existing signatures obtained from another pixel in the scene, or through a spectral library. Supervised means you click pixels to find 
in the scene and the algorithm is then put in place to identify similar pixels. Algorithms take into account every band in the image. Supervised classification uses the find and scene window as an interface. Um, algorithm selected its method drop down. Menu or the spectral algorithm drop down. It allows users to select pixels within a scene and change the name and color and adjust the threshold dynamically. All right, so that was a 10 minute sort of walkover. And next, we're going to work on a demo. Now, it is imperative that you do this the way I'm asking. I want you to read what's on the screen and then watch as it changes until we go to a new slide. Then pause the video and do what you just saw on your computer. So you're going to read about it, watch it, and then do it. Some basic instructions. So whatever I tell you here on this video supersedes whatever you read in the PDF uh, from Socket. And here's why. We're not going to be using the same data sets that Socket GXP used to develop this um, demonstration software. Uh, packet this uh, PDF that we're doing these exercises from. We're going to be using a different data source. And so nobody's files are going to be the same. Not mine, not yours, and it's certainly not going to be the same as the ones in the PDF. Um, I'll set you up with the data that you need and you can use it. Now it's imperative that you follow along don't be afraid to try something. That's the worst thing that can happen is that something goes nuts. And here's a good thing to remember. Socket has a super undo button. Uh, you can, uh, if you don't change the settings, I think the default is unlimited. And so you can just click the undo button and undo the last thing you did back until you did, back to you get to the point where you haven't done anything. So don't be afraid to you know, try something. The worst thing that could possibly happen is you have to start over with this particular exercise. Nothing that we do here is really built upon uh, something that we make earlier. And so you could do part of this and stop and come back and pick up that spot and move forward and you shouldn't have any problems. Also, the software is running on a server on Citrix and so you're going to have to use Citrix to get into this. And you're also going to have to go into our catalog because you got to make yourself a copy of the data. If everyone tries to use the data that I put in the folder uh, for you to work from, for you to copy rather, if everybody uses that to work from, uh, we will have significant file lock issues and uh, there'll be problems with the software running. So we're going to use our catalog, we're going to use socket and obviously uh, some folders in the student folder section of the L drive. So if you're not too familiar or if you've forgotten, this address at the top is the address for the Citrix server for off-campus stuff. And if you're thinking, oh, this doesn't work, I live too far away, I made this from 100 miles away from campus in a thunderstorm after a root canal. If you want sympathy, uh, look between that word that starts with an S that means feces and that horrible debilitating venereal disease that starts with an S, syphilis. Somewhere in between there, you'll find the word sympathy. And that's where you're going to find it because Citrix can be a pain, but if you're patient, it usually doesn't do bad, as by the fact that I made this in a thunderstorm from 100 miles away. So your next step, you're going to open up Catalog. You're going to copy uh, a folder of data called Tooth Fairy, which seemed um, reasonable for today since I had the root canal. And that's why we're doing a remote class today. 
And you're going to copy it and paste, not paste it, you're going to paste it in your student folder in Citrix so that you have a copy of the Tooth Fairy folder. Do not use the one that's already there to work from. That's mine. Only one person can use them at a time. All right. If you start looking at this and say, wow, this looks familiar. Yes, this data is some of the data that you've already used with some other softwares in class. Um, and I put more data in there than what we need because I want you to have the option. If you want to try some of the other things that's in the PDF that I haven't covered yet, you can go right ahead. Now, there's some other stuff like anomaly detection and change detection in there that we're going to go over next week. So there's no point in doing that. But anything up to the point of the last step revol uh, involving any of the classification procedures that I skipped or didn't do, by all means, you're welcome uh, to, to try to bring in some data and see if you can work through and understand how to operate the software. So at this point, uh, we're going to basically start just going slide to slide. And I'm going to show you screenshots of what I did and try to explain it. And the next three slides basically just cover what I've mentioned here above. So if you're ready, go ahead and open up your Citrix. Get the catalog open. Get socket open. And get ready. So as you can see, there's the GIS uh, Citrix address. Um, oh look, I've got three, it looks like, uh, notifications on LinkedIn. That's cool. Um, what I really want you to do, though, is go down here uh, and open up Catalog, and also go down and open up Socket. This is Socket. When you open up Socket, you're going to get this Workspace Manager multiple panes. We already talked about this in the previous video. You're going to um, add in some data by going up here to the top um, left of the image. Right beside the word file and edit and all those. Uh, the row below that there's a folder where you can click to open or you can go from file and, and uh, add in data. But it's, you know, classic uh, functionality there. Find the right thing. Add it. You want to add data. It's going to ask you what kind. You're going to say an image. And then you have to work your way through to the Tooth Fairy folder and find what you need. Now, in this case, we're looking for this Phoenix, Phoenix Arizona TIFF. Now, I want to point out something. The other software, um, it doesn't identify red, green, and blue. It identifies blue, green, and red between the two. They're different from one another. And so this is not the right colors here. You're going to have to fix this before you can do much of anything. And so how do you fix it? Uh, up at the top, there's image tools, and there's an analyze button. And then once you click on the analyze button, all the way to the left in that ribbon, you'll see select bands. And if you click on that, the bands come open. And you can see here that it's got red is one, green is two, and blue is three. Three is red, and one is blue. So you have to uncheck, well, under the R for red, you would go down and click in the box for band three. Leave green alone. In the box for blue, you would check in band box one, at band one. And once you do that, you click apply, this image is going to change a great deal. So here's the setup you want, blue and one, green and two, red and three. Now, here's the process they want you to do. That same analyze tab we just did, you're going to go for there. You're going to look for select bands and then the grayscale function, and you're going to click on the red band. And we're just going to look at the red band in the grayscale. And then after that, we're going to go back up to the view menu. We're going to find the preferences. We're going to look for the tools. We're going to select histogram and we're going to generate histogram. Drop down, select from a full 
resolution image and then click OK. So um, this is where the preferences look like and you can see under preferences, tools, histogram, to find it in the um, um, Oh, heck, I think I forgot what they call the thing now. Not the first window, not the workspace window, but the other one. So the way this works is once you load in your image into the regular socket, you double-click on the image, and it opens up the, the other portal thing. And in the other portal thing from files, you can find the preferences. So um, let's take a quick look here. Uh, the next step is to display uh, an image in a multi-port. And um, that's what I was just talking about doing. And once you've done that, you can look at this Enhance tab. And in the Histogram group, click the Dialog Box Launcher. And so what does that mean? All right, let's just slow down a little bit here. And you see you've got each of these boxes going from left to right. Um, right below, uh, you see it's like File, Home, Select, Draw, Geospatial, Products, View, Add-ons, Visualize, Enhance, etc. Those are the tabs. And we want to select the Enhance tab, which then changes that ribbon below to just options from Enhance. And then we're going to look for each of those blocks in there, looking for one called Histogram. It's over here to the right. Now, you can click on anything in there you want. But if you're not sure, that little droppy, boxy, pointy thing down there in the bottom right-hand corner of the Histogram box, That'll open up um, the histogram window. Now, I've put a bigger picture of the ribbon up there, and there's a red box around that so that you can see exactly what we're looking at. And when you do, it opens up the histogram. Now, you see here you have an input and an output. One of the things this software does automatically that's really helpful for you. It normalizes or equalizes out your histogram and takes care of some of that pesky stuff that you have to figure out about how you need to do what. Don't worry about it. This fixes it. Basically, it gets rid of all those low zero values and stretches out the rest of it so that you get a brighter, sharper image. Histogram shows the number of times pixel values occur in an image. X is a pixel value. Y is the number of pixels at that particular value. Right, so the input histogram on the left is raw. Low numbers appear black. High numbers appear white. When it's opened, it automatically is remapped so it looks the way it should. And so the results of the remapping are the output that you see here in the histogram. And it changes depending on where you're at in the image looking. Next, we're going to talk about the transforms. Transforms are used to manipulate the image history or image histogram through a standard set of algorithms. So transforms are available from the histogram group, the one we were just in, in the Enhance tab, uh, and from the Transform menu of the histogram window. And so if you click on that Transform button up there, this is what pops down below, and you can see the different ones. Linear, linear, max, min, normalization, etc. So we're going to go back to that Enhance tab. We're going to go over to the Transforms drop-down, and then we're going to select Normalize. And this fits the histogram to a normal bell-shaped curve. This basically makes darker parts of the image brighter and takes the really bright spots and darkens them up a little bit so that it just kind of equalizes those things out. Once you get a look and see what it looks like, then you can close up your multi-port. So next we're going to look at multi-spectral imagery and displaying it. The traditional four-bound uh, multi-spec is blue, green, and red uh, with near-infrared. And you can take any of those four bands and assign to any one of those three channels you like. When we look at true colors, that's red, green, and blue. When we look at false color, we substitute near-infrared in place of red. And so when you do this, it allows you to spot different things like uh, different types of vegetation or how healthy vegetation may or may not be. 
And so here's what I'm talking about. One on the left is true color, the one on the right is false color. So how do you display it? In Multiport, from the Analyze tab, you go to Bands, click Select. Once it pops open, you simply change the red, which we had the red channel in Band 3. Just move it down to Red 4, and what you will be looking at will go from a true color to a false color infrared. And then once you look at this, you can close down your Multiport. And you see what it does. The areas with certain types of vegetation or certain uh, vegetation in certain conditions. So maybe some vegetation is dying because of drought, other is watered, or maybe it's just different types of vegetation. Anyway, um, you get very different looking reds. Spectral masks are something that, that they use as well. Uh, basically, the bands on either end of the spectrum sometimes can get noisy, and so uh, this is used probably more in the hyperspectral, where it kind of gets rid of a lot of the junk so that you can figure out what is actually useful. This has potential for a lot of things. Um, the threshold lookup table allows users to map pixels of certain values or ranges to other various colors. Uh, and so um, the threshold changes the pixels, the threshold lookup changes the pixels of an image according to a percentage. And so for example, if you display the near infrared band by itself um, in the multiport, and you go up and find your enhance tab, and you look for the histogram, and you click that apply LUT threshold LUT, um, it has a little slider that allows you to adjust that. If you crank that all the way up to 99, only the top 1% of the brightest pixels is what it's going to display. So if you're looking for really truly high values in the near infrared, this is how you can do it. So he was asking, uh, in some of the other classes, some of you were like, um, if you have a particular band that maybe responds to the clay and you're trying to figure out uh, where in your landscape you have more clay, well, you know that that particular band is where clay is going to spike and you may not pick up anything else. Well, if you use something like this and you look for the, that band width and you pick the top 1%, you're going to get the ones that have the highest values in the range where the clays spike. And maybe that's all you need to find it. Anyway, once you run this and look at it and see what it does, you can close the threshold values. And so here's what I'm talking about. I selected band four, which is the um, near infrared band. And that is my image. I jacked my slider all the way over to 99. And when I did, I got this. And these are literally only the highest values in the near infrared. There's also lots of basic enhancements that are available inside the software. I just wanted to mention these. If you want to try and play around with them, you can go right ahead. Image pre-processing. Let's talk about this idea of dark subtraction. Uh, from the spectral algorithms list, there's one called dark subtraction. If when you click on that window, um, the window leave defaults and click apply. After viewing the results, close the results and then right click by selecting close. All right, long story short, here's what happens. Do the spectral algorithms, select dark subtraction. It gives you another window. Leave everything the same as it pops up and click apply. It's going to split your view, give you two images, and one is going to have the darkness removed. When you're done, and you have split images, right click on the one you want to get rid of and just select close. So there's the bands, there is the images, the one on the right has had the dark spots removed. Now, just looking at it, I don't know that I actually see so awful much there. But I'm sure at some level it made a significant change. 
All right, so bands. All right, there we go. Next, we're going to look at the unsupervised classification. Basically, these are algorithms that analyze imagery automatically. Unsupervised means it runs uh, without any signature input on your end. And it shows all different kinds of classes of stuff. Uh, the number of classes is set in the parameter box. The more you add, the longer it takes to calculate. Different means, k-means, ISO data. We've talked about those a little bit in class. Uh, you can look those up in the textbook uh, if you're really interested. Band ratio, NDVI, NDWI, lots of different ones. So let's take a look at some of this. We're going to start off with a... Um, they're talking about using a band merge chip in the, in the multi-port. We're just going to use the same thing we've been using. You just want to close up your multi-port, go back to your other window, double-click on the image, open up a new multi-port with the same data, and then you're going to find the Analysis tab, and you're going to go to Spectral Algorithms. You're going to select K-Means Clustering. Leave all the defaults the same. It's only going to ask for a couple classes. I bumped mine up to 10, I think. Uh, you can change that and play around with it a bit if you want. And then just click Apply, and it's going to load it up. Now, you can't really, it says the colors in the resulting image cannot be changed since it's unsupervised. And then close the panel once you've looked at it. So I did it, and I ended up with that crazy classification scheme over there on the right, which is hard to say exactly what that might be. Uh, another option is called supervised classification. Supervised classification uh, is an algorithm that's used to match in-seen pixels to some existing spectral signature. Now, it can be a lot of different things. A lot of times when we do supervised, it means that you are literally checking certain pixels one by one or drawing boxes in areas that have the thing that you're talking about. And the algorithm then takes that information and figures out what is similar to that and identifies it. Now the interesting thing is, as you add new classes, this starts classifying things out right away in real time. And so these various algorithms account for each band in the image. So it's not just the one you're clicking on, it's all of them. The supervised classifications um, use the find and scene window as an interface. And you can read the rest of these here. I want to show you what the pictures look like. So, uh, different ones, adaptive cosine, adaptive match, filter, absolute correlation, constrained energy minimization. Uh, you can also do normal Euclidean, spectral angle mapper, and all these other ones. I think we're going to do spectral angle, angle mapper here for a demonstration. And basically, uh, you're going to go in and find these particular areas and just draw a polygon inside and... That's pretty much that. You can also use signatures from the spectral libraries, and some of those are quite remarkable. Uh, now, here's what I'm going to do. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to display the image uh, in a new multiport. Go into the Analyze tab. You're going to find Spectral Group, and then you're looking for Spectral Algorithms. And then under Spectral Algorithms, you're going to select Spectral Angle Mapper. And then once you do that, you're going to click in the image to identify pixels or groups of pixels of interest. Now you've got two options. Uh, if you look over to the picture on the right, uh, right underneath the words file and view and signature, there's like four buttons. And two on the right allow you to click individual points or to draw polygons. All these are, are how you are selecting the things that you're selecting. Now, you have to come up with a name for every thing that you're classing. So I started out by just drawing some polygons in one cluster of trees and then identified a bunch of trees. I found the area where it was barren ground and I just called that dirt and it classified that. I found some houses and I lumped them into a polygon and it called that urban and I kind of stopped at that point just to see what I could get. And now I'm going to show you what that really simple classification comes up with. And this is not from doing you know, 35 different boxes. This is one polygon in each of these topics. So I got one polygon in trees, 
one polygon in some dirt, one on some houses. And this is what I got. Actually, this is what they're uh, coming from the slides, showing you how you can adjust some of these thresholds. I couldn't get that threshold thing to work. Um, I think that's probably something that's been changed in the uh, last software update, or uh, there's something in our particular data set that doesn't allow us to do that. Spectral libraries. Let me get back to this for a second. Um, for example, if you have data from Avarice from 1996, there is a whole cluster of things that they've already identified a spectral frequency for that you can select and add and it will then look for that in your classification when it does it and identify it as such. So if you've got average data, data that's really really useful. Alright so we sort of covered some of this. Maybe not as fast or as, as what you would, might want. I hope you've been following along and seeing what we're doing here. Uh, if you want more detailed explanations you can always look at the actual PDF which I will attach um, in the canvas site uh, probably actually before this gets loaded up. Here's what you're going to do. You're going to remove all the data that you have in your workspace, close down your multiport, get rid of everything. More or less open up a brand new socket. You're going to put in a new image. In the image I want, it's in your student folders, it's in the class folder, it'll be in your Tooth Fairy folder, not mine. It'll be in the anomaly detection folder, and there's this 5 May 1709 MIBS dash blah blah blah, whatever file it is here, that's the one you want. This is a nice multispectral image of some place, and what you're going to do next is uh, follow the next directions on these next couple pages and then save a screenshot of the supervised classification that you have at the end and the legend that you make for it because we're going to use the legend tool um, or I want you to learn how to use the legend tool and that's what you're going to upload for your lab uh, proof. Alright so let's see what we got. So this is your first part displaying your merged chip multiport don't pay any attention to that. That just means put in the image that I told you on the last screen. Analyze tab, spectral algorithms, k-mean clusters, boom. You've just done an unsupervised classification. Then it says display, display an MSI image in the new multi blah blah blah. No. Remove the other thing that you just did. From, or get close the multiport you just had open. Double click on that image again in the other uh, window. Now you got a new multiport. Analyze spectral group, spectral algorithm, spectral angle mapper, and you're going to go through and come up with some classes. Now you're going to have to take a look at this picture, set it up in real color, and try to figure out what all might be there. Maybe it's rocks, maybe it's desert, maybe it's parking lots, maybe it's a construction site, I don't know. You figure out what you can see there, what you think's there, and then make the appropriate classes. Uh, don't worry so much about adjusting those thresholds. Um, just make it work and run it. Once you do that, you're going to use this display a legend showing the names and the colors of the results from the view menu by selecting legend. And then uh, you can adjust the properties of it and such. Once you get those properties of your legend, of what is in the supervised classification of that second, that new image. That's what I want you to turn in. Screenshot of that. And then I'll see you next week. All right, so uh, just a quick reminder. You can follow along with this. It may not be the easiest thing to always keep track of, so I'm going to give you the PDF where I got the various clips and things out of it. There's more things that they ask you to do, a lot more, more than what I'm asking. Um, but you can feel free to work through that if you like. Uh, it would be good for you, but it would also be very, very, very time consuming. And I'm not uh, wanting to assign a giant pile of homework on you at this point in time because I want you to, if you're going to be doing remote sensing work, I want you to be doing remote sensing work towards your project at this point. Alright, good luck.
and I'll see you next week.